Hi, this is Yosef Bhardia, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Denver, Colorado. And we have with us once again Ildiko Vansha, Director of Community at Open Infra Foundation. Ildiko, it's great to have you back on the show. I'm happy to be back. Excited. Yes, I'm excited too. And uh, I used to joke that I see you more at Open Source Summit and KubeCon. And now this has kind of become your event because Open Infra has joined the Linux Foundation. So talk a bit about uh, how has been this event so far for you because this is now your event. I mean, it is interesting because, you know, now that the Open Infra Foundation joined the Linux Foundation and now we are all one big family, this event is like I'm catching up with Linux Foundation people as my colleagues now. So I'm meeting new people who are now my colleagues. So it's, um, it's very exciting. It's a, it's a nice phase. And I, I like this because it, it feels like that it's an opportunity for our ecosystems to work even closer together because the collaboration has already been ongoing before, but now we have an opportunity to really encourage that, uh, with our now extended family so to say so i'm i'm very excited to to be here and you know this is the first month um for for me and, and our foundation to be to be part of the linux foundation so we are just getting started and just like open the foundation this is also one of the most uh, inclusive and welcoming event uh, there are a lot of talks and session is spanning a wide range of topics uh, talk about uh, your presence at the event this afternoon, I have a presentation titled, What do legislations have to do with tackling maintainer burnout? Because when it comes to the open source ecosystem, you know, no projects have ever said that, oh, we have just enough or too many contributors, especially maintainers. So it is, I think, um, a very important topic to cover. And I hear other people talking about it as well. I mean, you know, how to address maintainer burnout and how to get more companies, organizations invested in open source. So that is what my talk this afternoon will also touch on. And tomorrow I'm moderating a panel um, and it's called It Takes a Village, uh, the case for a versatile open source workforce which is exploring the area of, you know, there are layoffs happening um, all over in the tech sector and it very often impacts open source roles like open source program offices and other roles uh, involved and, uh, and working with open source within these companies and, you know, getting caught uh, in the layoffs. So we will be talking about those crucial roles and responsibilities within companies that, that you know, these roles cover and hopefully shut some light on why companies should rather double down on that open source workforce rather than reducing it. I'm really interested in your panel that it takes a village as layoffs and burnout is a very serious concern, especially with the rise of Gen AI. In terms of, like, if we are touching on AI, I think that is obviously an upcoming um, area and everyone is really excited about AI. And when it comes to companies, I think many look at AI as a, as a cost saving opportunity, but AI can't really just replace people as is. And if you look around in the, whether open source or proprietary ecosystem, like not all AI tools are just there yet. So there is quite some frustration, you know, within like the developer community uh, through AI written codes. You still have to review that code. Um, for example, I, I heard examples from people saying that first look, the AI code looked really good. Second look, it still looked good. And then third look, there was actually a, a bug in it that could have been a big security vulnerability if the reviewer didn't catch that. So AI code still needs to be reviewed closely. It, it's not something that, that will just be, like the programmers will not be replaced by AI bots anytime soon. And when it comes to us learning how to work with the new AI tools and utilizing them, you know, for more efficiency that will 
take a lot of effort on our end, both in the tech sector and just, you know, humanity at large. And I think that in the open source ecosystem, it is also crucial to make sure that we are taking care of the people who are working with these new tools and learning these new tools and trying to figure out how to incorporate AI uh, generated code into you know the open source code bases and, and dealing with all that. So you, you need not just the developers, but also that support system that is around the developers. So you still need the, the legal people who are looking into the open source space and the AI space as well. You still need the developer relations people. You still need people within companies, part of management who are able to support the company's business goals and strategy through working on open source and incorporating AI into that workflow. So I think that having open source roles within the workforce, especially in the era of early days of AI is more important than it's ever been. You're also delivering a talk on maintain and burnout. Can you talk about what is the leading cause of it and why companies who consume open source should do their bit to help. My personal experience with this is that while there are companies in the open source ecosystem and tech and open source space who figured out how to integrate open source into their product development and maintenance workflows, most companies are not there yet. So for them, when it comes to upstream investment and upstream work, that is secondary. So, you know, I do maintenance work and, and hardening downstream first. And then later on, we will upstream those changes. And then they either do or they don't. And even when they do, that still does not incorporate maintaining that open source project per se. They are not actively participating in code review and maintenance type of work within those communities. So when it comes to the community side, they are receiving a lot of demand from the commercial space, but not enough investment. And investment could be, you know, direct upstream work and involvement and it could be other forms of supporting the community sometimes you know some communities just need some money to cover uh, resources host an event and doing those kind of things and for them money would help some other communities they need more people who do code reviews who do maintenance work who take on leadership roles who can become maintainers but these days it sounds like that we have a lot of tools to evaluate whether or not a project is, so to say, healthy. But companies often don't see their own role in making the project healthy and sustainable long term through their investment and involvement. So what I'm advocating for is that when you do maintenance and hardening and any type, type of work on an open source project that you depend on, you have to do that upstream. First, second, and in any place. So I think that today, one of the big challenges is that these kind of production development and maintenance type of tasks and work, it happens in the wrong place. It often happens downstream. It has to happen upstream. And that has an upfront cost and the change process to integrate that work into the production development workflow internally. But once you jump that, then your cost will actually go down and your product work, you know, will become sustainable and the open source ecosystem that you rely on will also become sustainable because you're doing the work with the community at the place where it should happen in the first place. So that's, I think, where the disconnect today is. Things just don't happen at the right place. And that's so true. And sometimes when I think about it, I've, I look at it as easiest solution, which is like companies who really consume a lot of open source, they should just dedicate 5% of their earnings to support and back the maintainers of the project that they consume. But that is not the reality we uh, see. You're also working on a white paper around edge computing. I'm curious about that project. 
Yes, I've been part of and being a co-leader for the opening for Edge Computing Group. We created the group, I think, what, 2017, eight years ago. And um, this time around, we decided, as we touched on AI before uh, or earlier, that we will explore the intersection of edge computing and AI. So we are working on a white paper and actually the, the working group just put um, the label final on the draft today, this morning, as we are recording this interview. So I'm very excited. Um, that the content is now final. The title of the white paper is Next Generation Edge, Edge Computing Architectures for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Use Cases. So what this white paper does is the group has been exploring the technology area for the intersection of edge and AI, and it's not really a fleshed out space yet. So this white paper provides a technology foundation for the work that needs to happen on the infrastructure side of things to be able to run AI workloads on the edge. Because when we look at AI today, I mean, I think you know, I heard people talking about building new nuclear plants just to be able to cover the power needs of, you know, training the large, huge AI models. Obviously, you don't have that on the edge, right? So we explored the edge computing technology area in the past, and now we put a spin on exploring that as AI is already putting high demands on cloud infrastructure and cl large cloud data centers, like how and what you need to do on the edge, on the smaller, more resource-constrained devices to be able to utilize edge um, AI, um, the AI technology and what AI has to offer. So that white paper is giving the foundation and we are now inviting everyone in the open source and all source um, ecosystem to come together and collaborate on how to build these edge infrastructures for the next generation AI workloads. So it's very exciting. I'm super excited. Yes. It will be announced on the week of July 7th. So hopefully everyone will be looking out for it. Now I want to pivot back to, uh, to you as a director of community, and now you're part of this much larger uh, community, what does it mean for you? Because now this is your community, which is span across projects like kernel, Kubernetes, IoT, OpenStack, AI, the list goes on and on and on. This is like a huge bite in the sense that I'm very excited about this opportunity. And as you, as you mentioned, you know, Director of Community, uh, it is a broad area. So I do focus a lot on, you know, community management and how these open source communities are organizing themselves, how they are forming, how they are structured, and how they can be successful and sustainable ecosystems. And when it comes to, you know, people from all over the world, big diversity coming from a lot of companies, cultures, um, languages, all the things that, that you can imagine. Like um, for these communities to be and remain sustainable, it can be challenging. And what I'm trying to focus on, or I have been trying to focus on is how open source foundations like the Open Infra Foundation and, you know, now we are part of the, the larger Linux Foundation um, family, like how foundations can help open source communities the best to be able to, you know, remain sustainable. So within the Open Infra Foundation, we've been working more closer to our communities to figure out how we can help, you know, uncover bottlenecks and uncover ways to resolve those bottlenecks, for example. What kind of metrics and data would you look into? Um, how would you survey people to understand their experience better? So as we are working through that with open infra communities, I'm, I'm looking forward to figuring out how to do this on the bigger scale 
and um, bring this to Linux Foundation projects and, and communities and also work with community managers in, um, and program managers in the Linux Foundation family to hear their experience, their ways and methods, how they have been tackling these challenges and how we can work closer together to enhance and improve the community experience. And as we talked about, for example, maintainer burnout, um, it's um, it's one thing to to encourage companies as you know this is something that will be sustainable for you to do. There are also legislations coming out like the Cyber Resilience Act in Europe, which are also pointing towards responsibilities for companies to, for example, report vulnerabilities, share the fixes. Um, of those vulnerabilities with the open source maintainers if they have those fixes. So as these legislations start to mandate, um, you know, companies to get involved and invest in the open source ecosystem, I think that our role as um, a foundation is to make sure that the communities are ready to welcome all that involvement and investment in a way that you know that they are accessible that that companies know how to get involved they can get involved and that hopefully we will be able to further grow and diversify these communities and you know that can have its own challenges so i'm i'm looking forward to working with uh, working closer to to more people to address uh, these challenges and make um, improvements in this space. So, Ildiko, thank you so much for joining me today. And as usual, I look forward to another discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I always love chatting with you.